Welcome to The Creative Influencer, where we discuss all things creative with an emphasis on influencers. The Creative Influencer is hosted by John Pfeiffer. John is an entertainment attorney in Santa Monica, California, who represents influencers and other creatives. This is episode three of the second season of the Creative Influencer Podcast. Today, we interview Dr. Jennifer Berman. Dr. Berman is a New York Times bestselling author, a practicing urologist, a pioneer and leading authority in the field of female sexual health, a former host of the award-winning CBS talk show, The Doctors, and a longtime advocate for women's wellness issues. Dr. Berman is uniquely qualified to discuss how social media is shaping both women's self-image and the sexual norms of future generations. Stay tuned for a fascinating conversation. I am joined today by Dr. Jennifer Berman. Uh, Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. You are a urologist and sexual health expert. Yes. And you are a celebrity in your own right. Okay. <laughs> you are. <laughs> Am I all right? You have that coveted According blue. To me. You, yes, indeed. You have that coveted blue check on Instagram. Thank you. And you have been on many TV appearances, and we'll circle back around on those, mm-hmm. but including the Oprah Show mm-hmm. and Conan O'Brien. Yep. Okay. So, because I've done a lot of a deep dive into your background, in the sense of your professional background, mm-hmm. um, and I also noticed that you come from an accomplished family. Mm -hmm. which we'll get to in the future. But where are you from originally? Originally, I was born in New York, in Manhattan. And I, um, we lived in New York until I was about 15. And then my parents moved to rural Southeast Georgia from New York. And um, so that kind of was a defining moment, I think, just in my, the trajectory of my life. And it was really a lot culture shock, you I know, can't imagine. For, you know, to put it mildly and verging on traumatic, but it is, um, you know, I really enjoy it now. It's a place that I go back to with my kids and I appreciate it, but it was um, very different. The Bible Belt, you know, we were Jewish. There were very few Jewish families down there. We got the whole anti-Semitism talk from my, it was like an out-of-body experience, right. but... And then yeah. did you stay there through high school? I was there through high school. My sister's four years younger than me, so she was there longer. So she was there for all of high school. So I was only there so 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. But I think it kind of shaped, you know, my path because I then I went to college in the South. And I was very, you know, so I, I sort of like acclimatized a, to a, a Southern, Southern Bell kind now. of yeah. way of a way of thinking. And... um you know, and and so that shaped me in different ways too. And um, but then I went to college in South, and then I ended up deciding after I graduated from college that I wanted to go to medical school. Well, that's what I was, yeah. was going to ask. What led you to medicine? So my father um, was a colorectal surgeon, and um, so I, you know, it was sort of something that I knew and was exposed to throughout you know, my childhood. And I would spend time with him in the operating room. Back in those days, I could go make rounds. I could go in the operating room. I was like putting sutures, you know. It so it was the family business. It was sort of like, yeah. And not only the family, the hospitals, it was very, you know, embracing and just sort of a way of life, but not something that I wanted to pursue as a career until, um, until uh, after I graduated from college and I chose my college at that time because I loved horses and I brought my horse. I was very, you know. And so you brought your horse to college with horse you? Horse Josephine came to college with me. <laughs> no, I, I got to digress a second because I saw you have, you participated in uh, horse jumping competitions. Mm-hmm. And still do. Well, I, I mean, yes. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't mean past tense. Um, yeah. When did you start doing that? So that was in New York um, when we, we lived in Manhattan, but we had a home up in um, Cold Spring, New York. So on the weekends, I would ride horses in the pony club there, and then I got sent away to summer camp, you know, as they do back east. They don't really right. do that here in California. like. But back east, everybody went to summer camp, and I was sent to horseback riding camps and just, you know, fell in love with horses, and it's a big part of my 
life. And so the horse came to college and then I graduated college and then that's when I went to medical school and didn't have horses. But as soon as I was in my residency in Baltimore, I ended up going to Baltimore for a residency and I um, sold a car and got a horse and you know, I've had them, you know, not such great horses, a little bit of crazy horses. And over time, I've been able to get better ones. <laughs> now, did you but, always do horse jumping or did you, was it uh, the competitions? Well, jumping competitions always, okay. yeah. How did you start that? The pony club, they teach you, you just work your way up from like grooming and picking hooves to, and the pony clubs, they have you doing crazy things like vaulting and, you know, Jim Kai, like fearless cross country, you know, they, so they totally acclimate you to horse life. And some people, you know, enjoy it and it's a passing. Some people, you know, latch onto it and make careers out of it. Others, you know, it's because, I mean, I'm not gift. I don't have the raw talent to become a professional rider or, or pro- I may have because I, I mean I certainly love it that much but it's um it's definitely a uh an addiction so to speak those that when you have that bug like to the degree that I have it and my daughter does too it's you know it's, it's in your blood it's in your blood you can't not have horses it's um you know it's your peace of mind I go out there and you know for my sanity and yeah. Uh, because I grew up on a farm in Nebraska and my dad would not let us get a horse because really? he said you had to feed it all the time. Instead, he got a four wheel drive pickup because you don't have to <laughs> feed pickups, <laughs> which yeah. is logic to it from a utilitarian yeah. perspective. But at any rate, uh, so back on track on your medical, you are, uh, you pick urology. Yeah. How did you pick that subset of medicine? That so specialty? I knew that I wanted to do a surgical subspecialty. And again, I had been exposed to it when I was, you know, from my father. And um, so I went into medical school thinking that I wanted to do general surgery or something surgical. And on the, our third year rotations, they assign you electives and you could choose, but um, I didn't get any of the ones that I chose, like plastic surgery or ENT, whatever the good ones were <laughs> that I thought I didn't get. Quote, good ones. Yeah. And I got a urology and I was like, and I said, oh, God, what is this? And I went, so I did the elective and it just happened that there was a, a one of the attendings was, uh, who ended up being one of my mentors, just happened to be super passionate about, for one, urology, but also teaching and medical students and embracing them and giving them projects and bringing, he was very, you know, not the other rotations would sort of tolerate you and okay, these ones are here now. I see, you know, they kind of shuffle you around and nod and, you know, but not really go out of their way to, you were more of a, of a uh, responsibility than something that they were enjoying. And, and, yeah. and it, so it was just a fluke that he happened to be there and he, and he was like that. And so there were projects that I started that I continued through the course of the year that kept me coming back there. And then I just, then it became, um, you know, something that I enjoyed and that I appreciated. It was, it is a surgical sub, especially at that time, there were very few women in it. So I saw. What percent are there of women versus men? Well, now it's pretty much equal, but then there was not, you know, it was predominantly men, very few women that were board certified or that were wanting to go into it. Um, now they need women for female urology is a whole field and it's, you know, they, they want women, but then there were few and I felt that, you know, that there was a need and that it was, it is a surgical subspecialty and, um, you know, people are generally healthy. It's not, you know, life or death. I had just come off a of general surgery, which was, you know, exciting, but extremely grueling, depressing and, um, you know, uh, require the higher you got the higher you ascended in rank in, in terms of being um, seniority in the hospital, the worse life got. The worst got. cases, yeah. But in urology, the higher seniority you got, the better. Those guys were out playing golf and, you know, they had people in the hospital taking golf. So it was a different, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, the cowboy shock trauma kind of, right. you know, fraternal thing, although it is, there. there's a lot of kidney trauma and bladder trauma and cancer and, you know, you know, congenital abnormalities of the genital urinary tract. There's a lot of complicated and serious surgery, but predominantly the patients are healthy. They have an acute problem that needs to be corrected. You fix it, they get better. And, you know, I like that. And then you are also, you also have a focus on women's sexual health. 
Tell me about that journey. Well, sexual health in general, that when I went, when I was rotating in urology as a third year medical student, that mentor happened to be Erwin Goldstein, who whose whole practice was devoted to male sexual health, so male ED. And he was a pioneer in that area in terms of the pharmacological therapy, in terms of the surgical therapy, the implants they were doing back then. And he was doing penile revascularization procedures for young men that had injuries and whatnot. So it was a real, um, you know, in a pioneering moment for sexual health. And when I, uh, so that I got interested in that. And then when I was doing my residency is when Viagra got approved right then at 1998, Viagra was getting approved for men. Um, and it was the first, and that was like groundbreaking. And there was a lot of interest and a lot of media attention surrounding that. And the, and I did my residency at University of Maryland, and we were one of the primary centers doing those clinical studies. So there was a lot of Interest, a lot of media, a lot of attention, a lot of focus, asking questions about, you know, what is, what is it? What I, yeah. And so when, when it, as awareness increased about Viagra, then there were women started pouring into the clinic asking, well, what about me? Or what about this? Or I'm having, my husband wants to have, I don't, and all of this like plethora of women, you know, inundating the urology. And they were like, well, you know, we don't, what do we do with these people? women? We're, we're men. And, you know, Jennifer deal with them. And, and there was really, and I recognized at that point that there was a disparity from how we address male and female sexual issues, that it wasn't really, there wasn't really a medical focus, even from the gynecological logical side. And so that's how I kind of went about, you know, trying to pioneer that area for, as a urologist. And and I took a very male-oriented approach at first because that's all I knew. I did this here, now I'll do it over here. We've got blood vessels, we've got blood vessels, we've got nerves, nerves. And I tried, you know, to the best of I could, well, you know, to, to um, from a physiologic standpoint. And then from there, we had to add hormones. And from there, we added the brain. And from there, we added the relationships and all these other things that that are now, you know, sort of custom in practice. Now, you are one of the leaders in the field in the sense of you st- one of the early ones to start in it. Mm-hmm. What's the, do you have competition now? I mean, are there others in the There's field? There's so many now. Like back then, there were very few that were doing this kind of work and certainly not in a medical setting, much less an academic setting. And now there are, um, now there's many people, like even just routine gynecologists, like this was the goal that primary care doctors, therapists, gynecologists are all kind of incorporating aspects of this into their practice. So, yeah, so there are a lot of people that that are not necessarily specializing in it, but that are addressing the issues, that have awareness, and that have the ability to treat, you know, for the most part. The problem is for women, there's not many FDA-approved treatments. It's kind of a complicated, subjective, you know, issue that isn't um, easily addressed with a medication. So that, you know, that's the challenge. I want to transition. You know, I'll come back to this, but I want to transition to your TV appearances. Mm-hmm. Okay, you've just the the list that I've compiled. You've appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show, Doctor Phil, the Today Show, Good Morning America, CNN, and Conan O'Brien, and many more. Because back then, like I said, when Viagra was becoming approved, there were we. My sister, I was working with my sister, who's a therapist. We were the only ones doing this. So every single there probably isn't a show other than Ellen I've never done Ellen but she has some issues about sex like there, nobody talks really about it on her that's the one that we have never done and I don't other late nights I don't think I've done Jimmy Kimmel or Fallon or the, the late night shows but every daytime talk show and Mac and we've done I've done we've done and then some and then um and that's based on you know one thing led to another thing you know what and it kind of do you have an up. agent that books this or is it just referral that the people have, those the producers were have all seen you? self-referred and i have an agent and a manager the agents are i'm not an actress so they're not like booking auditions and things for that right. so these things and publicists when i you know i've written some books and we've had publicists associated with that and then they would book things but i never really had to go out and proactively you know seek these opportunities i get asked a lot by doctors because you know how do you do that i want to get into media how do you do it and it's um it just happened i didn't try um if i had to try to tell somebody what to do now um they 
you know, you need to have a publicist. It's not an agent because like a PR person that has a pitch and you have to have, you know, you have to look a certain way and have some sort of, you know, gimmick edge some hook. idea yeah. issue that's, you know, compelling and that fits into a, a timetable of what they're doing. And then also connections, knowing somebody who knows somebody who knows the producer of this and then cross your fingers yeah. <laughs> and hope it goes well. Now, do you have a pre-appearance ritual that you go through? No. And for the, I am a professional guest. Like I can do that with my eyes closed and, you know, and just go with it, whatever. When I have to, and if, and I've had to with, because my sister and I had a show called Berman and Berman and we were hosts of that. And then on the doctors, I was a co-host or, so I didn't really have to carry it. I could just do my thing. So when I can just do my little thing in a, you know, it's very easy for me. If I have to carry it and do it on, and that, this is the next stage of my career is the expectation that I'm going to have my own show, which I, which is, you know, I have uh, I'm mixed feelings about because, you know, that's a whole nother level of, of responsibility of, you know, headspace preparation and, um, and also ability like the, even just learning how to read the teleprompter without, you know, you have to without read, looking like you're reading. You know, looking like reading. I had to learn how to do that. And so on the doctors, we, we would do different, you know, pickups, you know, intros in and intros out or integrations about products that have to read something. And, you know, that was the skill set that you have to learn. So, um, yeah. So the, the ritual would be, um, you know, pre- preparing when there is preparing to do to read the information and content and have mastery of the information. There is, if there's a script, read it, try and get it. Um, oftentimes they don't want to tell you what the questions are before, but for like, for the doctors, I knew what the script was and knowing the information, having some semblance or of, of, of where awareness, it was going. what you're going to say. And then the biggest challenge is if it, for me, is if it's live. So live, you know, the three, if it's taped, it doesn't matter. You can make mistakes. You can stutter. You can, they'll cut it. They'll edit it. If it's live, then you're, it's like a whole nother. Did I tell you this is live? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no, but it's, it's radio, not. so there's no camera. To but the live thing, like with Good Morning America and those shows, or even Conan is live to tape. So it's a live audio. You know, they don't, you're not really allowed to mess up in that either, even though it's not live, live. It kind of is live. So, um, so those are, it's a higher level of, um, I know this is going to be like asking you, which is your favorite child, mm-hmm. but which was your most fun show? I think the Conan ones were probably the most fun for sure. And out of my comfort zone and, um, you know, interesting. And from the, and then also having a live audience and there were a lot of men and it was male oriented. And then there were celebrities on there. So that was probably the most fun. Oprah was back then, but that's going back in time. You know, that was like a big deal. It still is. And that was amazing too. I wouldn't say it was fun. And Good Morning America ended up being fun because we, I would do those a lot, but it wasn't in the beginning. I would have panic attacks, literally like palpitations starting my, the blood running out of my lips. My, and I do those with my sister and she'd see me like starting to sweat and melt. <laughs> and then she would start. And then within like a minute and a half, I you could, I could come in. Go. But the first like minute is like dying. Uh, um, for the listeners, there are many of the Conan appearances are, are on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And I would highly recommend them mm-hmm. because, um, you taught Conan to do Mayo Kegel exercises. We taught him how to do the Mayo Kegel exercises. We taught him where the G spot is. We taught him about um, a lot of things. You taught him about the jade egg. The jade egg for improving pelvic growth. So we taught him about Foria, which is a cannabis product to enhance sexual pleasure in women. And Did you come up with the concepts or was it the producer, are you talking to the Conan producers? I talked a lot to the producers and they want to know like what content they would, they would learn things on their own and ask me or that I would say things to them and, they, and then we kind of, there's a pre-determined, Discussion. yeah. Um, and then you stimulated, my favorite is you stimulated him with the womanizer. Yeah. Then he learned about the womanizer, which is a vibrator, not really a vibrator, but an erotic toy, toy. for women. And he, yeah, we, we use that on him. Uh, which show 
uh, uh, um, intuitively, I think I know, mm-hmm. but which show has had the most impact on your career? Um, you know, I guess those, um, those, those shows are, are most like recognized and people see, I think the mo the biggest one on my career would probably be co-hosting the doctors because that, that became a platform for brands. Then there would be large brands that wanted to align with me based on that platform as seen on the doctors or whatever else. And so that there would be, you know, with Kimberly Clark, with Poison Depends and a large Johnson Johnson, you know, large cram ocean spray. Um, so that, that platform led to larger brand spokesperson advocacy um, opportunities. If we're talking about career, how long were you on the doctors? For like four seasons, I was. I've always been on, sort of as an intermittent expert, but like as a recurring every week, having to go in there, yeah. about four years. And I think it's still going. It's not the ratings aren't so great. I think they're kind of like. I believe it is still going because I, I googled it last night. You did, and I think Doctor Phil's kind of like you know funding it along, but it it's um yeah it, it definitely is uh that was that was a really good learning experience for me about um. You know, just being an on-air host and navigating all, that. and being able to co-host because they, there, I'm used to just talking. Like when somebody asks a question, I answer it, and there's nobody else talking. Okay. But now a, que- a question is, and then there's three other people talking, and you have to learn how to, you how know, to manipulate yeah. them. Uh, have you always been comfortable in front of a camera, or has that been a learned thing? I didn't know that I was comfortable or not comfortable. I just did it. And um, from the very first, the beginning, when I said those studies were going on and the press was showing up at the hospital wanting to speak to the clinicians and they kind of threw me out there and said, you know, talk to them. And I just went out and talked. And I guess, you know, I looked okay. And I said, you know, and then they were like, oh, there's a, she's good. Let's have her come back. And and that led to that one, those interviews when I was a resident you know, not having slept in my scrub, I just went and said, you know, led to, you know, CNN and Charlie Rose and Anderson Cooper and Larry King, like all, all just, you know, who's this woman talking about sex? And so that it was sort of a novelty. And then with my sister, and we became and we were in Boston at the time, they were like the mini Dr. Ruth and the Viagra twins, you know, there was this novelty of these two sisters talking about sex. And, um, yeah, so that was. And I want to turn to that to the books with your sister in a second. Mm-hmm. Do you find that talking to men about sex is difficult for the guy? I mean, you clearly don't have a problem yeah. talking, but is it difficult for most men to be comfortable talking about it? You know, I when I was practicing, like as a urologist and a fellow, they they, you know, a little bit. The you know. Older, much older men and then very young men were kind of like put off a little bit. But otherwise, they just, you know, whoever could, it was a clinic and you're the doctor you're wearing a white coat and, you know, whatever. They they sort of, and this was like University of Maryland, the urology clinic. They wasn't, you know, they, they, they were happy to have a doctor. Um, and then, but now I think, um, you know, if they're uncomfortable, they don't really, you know, let it on that much. I think more in personal relationships, it's probably the uh, misconception that because I specialize in this, that I have some, you know, innate abilities or talents or knowledge beyond, you know, most, which isn't the case. And obviously, (laughs) I was going to ask then in the personal (laughs) side, is it hard for, for men, you know, as friends, to, to talk about this, I mean, you know, because most guys don't even mm-hmm. talk to the other guys about it. Mm-hmm. But yet, yeah, long to talk to a woman about um, about what you do. Mm-hmm. They do like they once I for however it plays out, you know, once you sort of open up those doors, they'll yeah. They, I think it just has to do with my level of comfort. There's not, um, people always ask, you know, are they intimidated by you or whatever? You know, I don't, I don't know. I, I know that, um, I know that it always, that it always comes up and it's annoying that feeling of that I have some like hidden abilities or whatever, or that, you know, there's this, 
magic bullet somewhere. Or that I, like, in my sexual, what do they call those, like a surrogate, like I've got all this, you know, these skills and things. But um, but for the most part, I think that um, that the men are pretty, and are pretty open about having those discussions and it's becoming more timely and we're becoming, it's, there's less of a stigma associated with it. And, um, yeah. So you are a, an author. Mm-hmm. You've written at least two books that I was able to mm-hmm. find. Um, and they're both with, uh, your sister. Mm-hmm. The first one, was, I don't know, first in time, but mm-hmm. the first one I have on my list mm-hmm. <laughs> was uh, New York Times bestseller for women only. A revolutionary mm-hmm. guide to reclaiming your sex life. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you come up with the idea? So that book for women only, a revolutionary guide to overcoming sexual dysfunction and reclaiming your sex life. We got um, it was just I forget. Um, it was I was we were I was at Boston University in the crux of all of these these things going on. I had finished my residency and now I was doing research in Boston. That's what happened. And we had an opportunity to, or a desire to kind of put it all together, everything, you know, the research and everything that we were doing. And my sister had finished her PhD with this woman named Helen Fisher, who was an author who'd written The Anatomy of love and mating and captivity. She was an anthropologist. And so Helen Fisher had a literary agent named Binky Urban, who was like Devil Wears Prada. She was an agent at ICM. She may still be. And she was the like literary agent of nonfiction. And because of Helen Fisher, my sister had trained under Helen Fisher. We got to Binky and Binky like saw, you know, the possibilities for the it. possibility. And it became these, you know, we became her like, little minions and she went out and she pitched and we got all book offers big ones and so then that's how that ha- that happened and then she arranged for um the that was with um Simon and Schuster I think and then they had a public PR department within that but Binky got another publicist they got them to hire another PR firm um what were their name but those are the ones that got us on Oprah and People magazine and that's how it became a bestseller uh, we're talking Hillsinger about- Mendelssohn. That's what, that's who they were, and they uh, Sand. I think her name Lip, was it Lippy Taylor. Lippy Taylor. I don't remember, but whoever the publicist was had the connection at Oprah and just hounded, 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 and once got we, on. we got in there. Uh, your sister's name is Laura Berman. Yes, she is a relationship therapist. Mm-hmm. How did it happen that both daughters? Ended up in this field. field. And I, that's a good question. So she's a sex therapist, relationship therapist. Um, she, uh, it's, it's an interesting, I, you know, I don't know exactly, however, but, you know, with my father being a colorectal surgeon and there was a lot of open and frank discussion about anatomy and body parts and sexuality and, I can um, only imagine Thanksgiving dinner was an interesting conversation. Everything. And my dad was very provocative and, you know, sort of, um, you know, pushing people's comfort zones and talking about subjects that people didn't want to talk about. That was normal for us. So that probably is how. What is it? Uh, Having, oh, your second book. Sorry, I forgot. Mm. want to hit that. It's uh, Secrets of the Sexually Satisfied Woman, Mm -hmm. 10 Keys to Unlocking Ultimate Pleasure. And it was based or centered around a national woman's sexual satisfaction survey right so we had created the the survey with rand which was that was like the that was the whole fun of that book was working with rand and gout to create a validated survey learning how to do that with the phone you know do it through the phone and randomizing who the people were and so that was the process of that book and that um yeah and so that was identifying the similar characteristics of women who were happy and satisfied. What what do they have in common? What's the top three? You know, they, it, it remains the top three is that they have, um, you know, happy with your sleep, happy with your you know, overall general self-esteem and happiness with yourself and 
happiness and satisfaction with your partner. Now, having been a published author on uh, mm. two successful books, what's your takeaway lessons? I don't like writing books. <laughs> I really hate it. I feel like I need to do, you know, there's ideas and I want to get them out. But the process of writing, for anybody who has the idea, I want to write a book, it's agony, for me at least, torture. Because it's, you know, you have to be like sitting for long periods of time and going into, and, and like big, like looking at a huge mountain and then you're like one step in and that every day. You know, so you have to like it's a it's a unique um, field of, for writers, a very solitary kind of confining, isolated, depressing. <laughs> <laughs> and I just and I because I like I'm a big picture person and I want to delegate. I don't want to be the one to write. So we had actually a co-author. She wasn't a blind. What do they call it? A ghostwriter. Uh, ghostwriter. She because I wasn't going to hide it. We need her, and she. Her name is Elizabeth B. Miller, and she went on to be the White House correspondent and had a really big career. Not because of our book, but she was very talented. Well, how and, do you know it wasn't because of your book? <laughs> maybe it was, and she got. But she, um, so she would. I, I could dictate to her, and she would ask questions, and I would just talk. Do, 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 do. And then the, she would put it in some sort of context, and then the editor. This is what I realized too. No, Nobody gives them credit. The real writers, the really gifted writers, the are the editors. Maybe they're not the most creative. I don't know why they're not writing because they're the best. Like she could take whatever this and turn it into exactly my voice and exactly the way and the you know the, the way that it flows and this and the arc and whatever. And you know it was amazing. So yeah, so editors, good editors, are like very very talented. So even though you don't have any plans to write. Another, or even though it's painful to write books, mm -hmm. do you have any plans to write any? I don't have books? any plans, but I would, I will. I have lots of ideas for them, but I would need, I really would need a, a person who, who can take the ideas, and, um, organize them because I'm a little bit all, and and give birth to them in a, in a way because it's. I would have to quit everything, you know, I, it's, it's a full-time job to really do it. And, you know, if you're writing and like, there's a woman named Christy Funk, who's a breast surgeon. She's the one that operated on Angelina Jolie and she has a really busy practice and she just wrote a new book, but like the gold standard for breasts. And it was a huge project for her to undertake. And she has triplets. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're like tweens now. It, it just is, it's a lot. Um, would would the starting spot to your path to celebrity be Viagra? I think the starting path to my it's an odd way to ask that celebrity question. Celebrity started was just chance, being in the right place at the right time of a of a change in culture. There was something going on in America at that time, an awareness. And I was, you know, in Baltimore, Maryland, in a little, you know, university setting and got in front of a camera, not by choice, by default, got to, and then that sort of snowballed. And have and you did. had help with your brand or has this been all you? I have you? no help with my brand and I really need help with my brand, <laughs> even as I get older, because I'm realizing, you know, that, that it the as there's as social media has expanded and as there's more and more of these people and these things and you know the messaging is getting more diluted and people are getting confused and what you know i i feel like I, that i have you know a platform and years of wisdom and experience that needs to be um encapsulated and delivered and you know in terms of not only information in terms of not only education but developing of products books that i don't like writing but that need to be written <laughs> And things like that. What advice would you have to young doctors who are starting out? It's very hard. Medicine is, you know, I think this new age of doctors is going to be, because medicine has changed so much, the people going into medicine are going to have to be better in terms of an entrepreneurial spirit. And they're going to not, they're going to be 
you know, with, with telemedicine and robotics and technology, the next generation of us are going to be business and tech savvy. They're going to be able to come out of practice and there are going to be social media and marketing. You can't just finish residency and then put a shingle up anymore, which is what we did. You just were a doctor. You were in the yellow pages. Now, you know, the, these guys that have been in practice the for decades, the real heroes of plastic surgery are getting taken out by the young guy coming out that has, you know, the bots and the this and the marketing that, you know, the Facebook, like, are ta- you know, they're, they're, regardless of their experience their experience or their ability so i think that you know the advice is to um learn about social media learn about marketing because you can't just rely on your medical degree anymore you have to be able to um reach the consumer and patients are now consumers they're not just patients so it's it's a different um it's a different business you have a large social media following do you have a favorite platform? I I don't really, you know, I Instagram is easier for me. What I need really, the, you know, as a doctor myself and all these other doctors, you need a social media person and you need a search engine optimization website person and you need a marketing and branding person and you need a publicist. So now if you need all those things, imagine, you know, so your, your budget that you need per month to manage all that. So if you need that part, that budget in the 30,000 range to really do it, then how many patients do you have to be seeing? Certainly not manage care. So now you have to be going out. So it's a whole whole different different ball game and I, so none of the social media venues really appeal to me but I do them I have to do Instagram is really easy and I have no idea what I'm I just post whatever I need a social media person to kind of tell me and direct me and do this and do that but so I so again I've been lucky that I can just sort of exist and do that and and i've maintained sort of a status quo but the next phase of what i you know because now i'm getting old i'm in my 50s can't you know i'm only going to be able to be in front of the camera for you know it's gonna i'm getting old my brain maybe i'll get alzheimer's who knows so my brain is still good my i'm still physically in shape and so i have to um you know i feel like I, there's a window of time that i should be like what, what my pièce de resistance or whatever that i have to you know, figure out what that next thing is going to be. Have you seen in your practice any impact on social, the impact of social media on women's self-image? Yeah, totally. Especially about their genitals and this whole genital, the way things look down there and changing the way they look. And 100% social media has impacted not only body image and self-esteem, what's aesthetically pretty or not, but even in their genital area, um, how things should look and should see is social media um has impacted that how how would a woman decide what they should look like compare because based on ideals that aren't real you know media images and porn and things that you know are that are just not real idealized altered or considered um, attractive based on what they perceive men are looking at or wanting out of it. And men, unfortunately, not so much men, but younger men, boys becoming men are getting skewed about what's normal as well. Just by what you're seeing on social by media. By what they're seeing on social media. And also porn, because then they, they, it's so, so accessible right now that their brains are getting wired in an altered way than back in the day when you maybe had a Playboy, you looked at a magazine. It's not that, you know, it's so much so fast that it's changing the, the pathways of arousal in, um, in boys and girls for that matter. Do you see that changing anytime soon? It's getting worse, you know, yeah, it's, and we'll see the impact. I think it's, you know, we are seeing the impact with this, everything that's going on with the Me Too movement is repercussions of that. These are the older guys that are now, you know, they, they've, they haven't, they weren't in the midst of all this and look what's happening to them. It's going to say, we'll see. And it's sort of, 
on the upside of all that happening, these younger ones that are coming, you know, are going to be, there, there's boundaries for them now before it gets out of control. Like we, a little, little bit of Harvey Weinstein, you know, put those on steroids. That's what these guys would and could become. But we've sort of put a fence around them, you know, hopefully that, that has it contained and, you know, boundaries and awareness and sort of education and limits that, that it, it'll, um, you know, it'll, the pendulum will kind of swing back, hopefully. Uh, speaking for men who who haven't done that, mm-hmm. men know what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Whether they follow what they know is a whole different issue. And clearly, well, they may know, but they don't care, or they know, but the rules don't apply to them. Right. And I saw that because my daughter was in boarding school for a year back in Connecticut, and I and this is I had this epiphany is when it starts. And it starts in probably like when they become sort of high in high school, boys are starting to learn what they can do and what they can't do, what they can get away with, what they can't, what girls will allow, what they won't, where, you know, you can move and where you can't and where you stay in. And in these elite boarding schools in particular, in private schools too, especially for athletes, scholars and athletes, there is this gross sort of turning a blind eye to bad behavior, you know, behavior that crosses the line a little bit. And um, I, I, so just my daughter, just in the one year, there was several instances that impact her and her friends. And I was shocked and appalled at how the administration sort of handled it. And, and Is this pre-Me uh, Too or post-Me Too? Beginning in the midst of it, I think, mean, like right, this was um, a year and a half to two years ago. So it was, we were in the throes of it, but not. I think Kevin Spacey was about to get Harvey. They were they were coming out. So it, so this is going on out in the world, but in but in in the kind confines of there in the private institution, the rules and laws that go that apply to the outside world don't apply in there, and that's when they're learning. This is what I can get away with. This is what I can't. This is what these girls are allowing me to do. This is what they're not. And if they get away with it in high school, which most of them do, a thing here, a thing there. By the time they get into college, then it takes another step, then it pushes it a little bit more, and then and everybody keeps on turning, well, he's going to Yale, or he's there, or that. and then, you know, so the girls are part, I felt like we, women are equally as responsible as the administration as a boys, because we're sort of turning a blind, we were, we're not even turning a right. blind eye, or this is just what they do, or whatever. So um, I think that, that there's a heightened level of awareness now, and yes, they they know right from wrong, but they are enabled and yeah, especially the athletes and sort of protected. Shifting gears again, mm-hmm. do you consider yourself to be an influencer? Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily consider myself a social media influencer because. I don't, I haven't used my social media to say, do this, do that, you know, this is this, this is that, but I'm an influencer from the standpoint of my voice and that when I have opinions and when I talk, you know, publicly to, you know, on camera or off camera, camera, that people, you know, hear me, believe what I say. I've managed to maintain, you know, my credibility. I haven't, you know, gone off and become the poster child for, you know, I've, remained kind of impartial as, as an expert and an advocate and a um, activist. Do you see both men and women? I see predominantly women now, but men in the context of the relations of women, like the partners or boyfriends or, you know, of, of my patients and other men per, you know, that happen to come in, but I don't have a huge male practice. What are some of the common misperceptions? And I'm going to ask it both ways. Do women have about uh, women's sexual health, their own sexual health? Um, the misconceptions, I'm not sure if it's misconceptions, but that women um, sometimes don't um, – 
it, I think it's changing now and it's partly generational, but there, w- there was a, a time where, you know, everything, it was up to the man to, you know, what he wants or the, that it was very dependent on my satisfaction is based on him doing or not doing something or him being or not being something. And that, and the responsibility for your own sexual health and satisfaction enjoyment, it, that was sort of, a, you know, something that women didn't really grab onto. And that's changing, especially with these millennials coming, you know, they've got that covered. They're very <laughs> empowered and entitled and fluid and all that stuff. So I think that from the male side, um, men um, feeling that, you know, pressure in terms of orgasm, and, which then la- leads to women faking orgasms, you know, that the, that if I don't have, if she's not doing this or doing that, then I'm not pleasing her, or that I'm not good, or that I'm not, you know, I need to find somebody else who I can't, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and it's usually just a matter of um, education and communication. Shifting gears again. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about your research. I saw that you have contributed to, and I don't know if this was the marketing term, but the weed, a weed tampon. That was um, with a company called uh, Foria, which was the cannabis um, oil that is a the to CBT. enhance it's it's CBD and THC, and the it wasn't a tampon that they they then developed a suppository with CBD THC based for um, menstrual cramps. How did it work? I mean, I mean it's just it relax- really well? cramp- Yeah, for it, it um, relaxes smooth muscle, so it helps with cramps, increases blood flow. What else is on your plate? What's, for you, what's going forward for you in the future? Well, I just got this in the mail when we're talking about men. Not to be intimidating or anything when we're talking about that. <laughs> Which is asexual. You're holding this is a asexual. Male, this is a male masturbator. And do the, they send, do companies send you these they things? They send me these things. And I haven't been in the male erotic toy space ever. I haven't been in the erotic toy space period, but this is the fleshlight and it's very, so this is the future of, you know, the, the, um, virtual sex and within the, this is like some, you know, Pentagon NASA level silicone flesh-like material that is like human skin. And then in there, in the fleshlight, you know, you put your penis in there. <laughs> so I'm, so, so on the future is that, um, I want to be developing products, not necessarily this one, but we're working to develop products. I have a TV show that we're, that I'm working on with one of the executive producers from Bravo, a two, two shows actually. So hopefully those will come to fruition. And, um, yeah. And tell us the names of your books again. The books that I have is yes. For Women Only, A Revolutionary Guide to Overcoming Sexual Dysfunction, Reclaiming Your Sex Life, a long title. And the other one is Secrets of the Sexually Satisfied. And they're both available on Amazon? Yes, both available on Amazon. And how can people find you on the internet? People can find me by Googling, you know, Dr. Jennifer Berman. My website is BermanSexualHealth.com. And this is the website in progress. I've hired my new SEO guy, who's your friend Isaac, to help me optimize the website and get it more user friendly. So I'm in the process of doing that. And my social media is at Jen Berman MD. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you for having me. That's it for this time. If you enjoyed our podcast, please write a review on iTunes and tell your friends to subscribe. If you have any questions about influencers or suggestions for future episodes, email them to john at pfeiffer at pfeifferlaw.com. Thank you for listening.